This is the first Lord's Day, 2023. So glad that it happened on the very first day of the year. We can start it out right. I want to start this morning, though. I want to thank, uh, I want to thank you guys for the wonderful, thoughtful gift that Rob and I received for Christmas from church. Um, we're looking forward to it increasing our waistline in the very near future, so we appreciate that. I mean, we really have a, we have a great body here in Christ and a great, great group of folks, and, and we are honored. Uh, you know, it's actually our blessing to be able to serve this place. All right, let's start. Where we uh, normally do? Ready? For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and the spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Hebrews 4 12. 2 Timothy 3 16 says, All scripture is inspired by God and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. Many of you probably heard of it actually probably use the idiom, what's new? Right? Anybody not use that or not ever heard that or anything there? No, probably not. When the dictionary defined, uh, defines this phrase as a standard, casual reading to inquire politely and often superficially about what is happening in someone's life. You know, the superficially part is probably like, what's new? And I really want to hear all that. <laughs> but the answer is most often, I would say, what's new? What's the answer? Most often. Not much. Right? Yeah, not much. All good. But when we ask ourselves as Christians, or we ask a Christian brother or sister, what's new? The answer shouldn't be not much. Revelation chapter 21. There are two future prophecies for things that are going to take place in the end. What is about the new heaven and a new earth? I'm sure we all heard that, right? That's coming. Another one is going to burn. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. And, 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 and another one is about the new Jerusalem. We see Jerusalem coming down, and it's glorious, and it's wonderful, and we see that happening. But in between those two future prophecies, verses 5 through 9, we see a group of promises that while they are future, they are also present and past. They are promises that are made to believers and unbelievers that are sandwiched right between those two future prophecies that affect us right now today and have affected Christians you know, throughout, throughout the millennium. We're going to look at that and talk about those, one of those promises. There are some very negative promises to people who do not believe and don't end up believing in the name of Jesus Christ. But we want to read one of the very good ones. So let's start there as well. It says, he who was seated on the throne said, look, I am making all things new. I am making all things new. I want you to notice something here this morning, that the word making is there. That this is a perfect translation from the Greek. It's not made perfect like past tense. It's not will make perfect like it's future tense. This is taking place it is right now. It is in the process of being done. Jesus is making things new. If you look at the, 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 the word itself, it's, it's present indicative active. Present is present, you know, present tense. Uh, active is active voice. That means it's, it's being done. It's something that's being done. And this other thing that's called indicative is a, is a word that means it's true. It's going to happen. It is absolute. We read in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 14, it says, For by one offering he has forever perfected those who are being sanctified. We talked about this last week, the week before last. You're, you're already perfect in God's eyes. That through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, when he shed his own blood, went to the tomb for three days, and then rose again. This work that he did perfected you in God's eyes. If God sees you as the done deal, you're complete, you're finished, you're perfect in God's eyes because he sees us through Jesus' glasses. Amen. Amen. Very, very glad that, that's the, that is the, uh, that's the truth. But we're also being made perfect, new, daily, as taking place Always or should be, and that's through the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. So, are we perfect or are we imperfect? It's 
It's confusing, right? And which is it? Am I one or am I the other? What is it? Nicodemus was likewise confused when he had his conversation at night with Jesus Christ. And this is a very familiar verse. Everybody should be absolutely aware of this verse. But it, Jesus talking to Nicodemus says, Jesus answered it, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Being born again is that salvation. Just like what when Nicodemus asked, well, you're right, can, a, can a man go back, enter back into his mother's womb? And you know, the misunderstanding of what this was talking about, no, it does not mean anything in this in the physical, it does not mean a literal physical rebirth. Um, he used the term reborn to affirm the need that Nicodemus has had, and every one of us has as individuals to be redeemed, spiritually transformed, refashioned, and renamed through God's grace. Jesus explained that to enter the kingdom of God to experience true transformation, true transformation, that's what we're talking about today. You have to have forgiveness, healing, renewal, and regeneration. Sin has to be overcome. And the only way that happens is a spiritual rebirth. And the only person that can do that for us, just like we talked about, is Jesus. So Jesus has already done that work. He has already made us that way. He's the only one through, through which this is possible. But that's not the end of the story. Now, talking about Jesus, it says, but now he has obtained a more excellent ministry because he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no occasion would have been sought for a second. So we see Jesus in these verses as the mediator of a new covenant, a better covenant made on better promises. We all, you know, we all should know that that's the case. And that it, this new covenant replaced the old covenant because the old covenant was full of faults. Okay, not because God made a bad covenant. If, if it was all up to God in the old covenant, it wouldn't have been faulty. But because man is faulty and cannot keep the covenant, and didn't for a long time, for thousands of years, didn't keep the covenant. Something new, something different needed to take place. And when the time was right, when the time was right, God sent his son, died on the cross, shed his blood, spent three days in a tomb, and then raised again to defeat, finally, sin and death. All right, this, this was a plan from the very beginning. God wasn't making it up as he went. He knew exactly what was going to take place. He knew exactly why it was going to take place. It was no big surprise for him. So it, it all took place exactly as it was supposed to. But still, even though we know those things, we have to understand this perfect being made perfect part. We have to be able to take a look at what does that actually mean. And to do that, um, we're going to look at some things that Paul has to say to us. That if this part is true, then this part is true. And we'll take a look at all of each one of those. Therefore, and everybody ought to know this verse. Therefore, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away, but all things have become new. Any man or woman is in Christ, anybody, then they are a new creature. If anyone is in Christ, then all things have been made new. That's on a spiritual sense. And to understand that spiritual sense, we have to know what, what this therefore is there for. Okay. This is the if-then statement. The therefore replaces the then, but we need to know what the if is for us to be able to get what this actually means. So we need to read the previous two sentences, or two verses. This is it. He died for all, that those who live should not from now on live for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. So from now on, we do not regard anyone according to the flesh. And I want to read that one again, I want you to remember. So from now on, we do not regard anyone according to the flesh. Okay. Yes, though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet we do not regard him as such from now on. All right, so 
Did Jesus come and live a physical life on this earth in the flesh? Yes, he did. Did his flesh die on the cross? Yes, it did. Is he now, because of his work at the right hand of the Father, being the mediator of the new covenant for us? Yes, he is. We do not, we no longer consider him in the flesh, even though he is all, all man and all, all God, all the time, forever and ever. We don't consider that. We only consider the spiritual nature of Jesus and what he is telling us to do when we do that in obedience. But what I want you to catch is you catch the part that flesh doesn't count any longer. It doesn't count any longer. And we can all clap for that. That's a good thing, right? You know, hallelujah. My flesh does not count against me because God sees me as perfect. It's done. The deal is done. Thank goodness. Because, boy, we'd have a big problem if that wasn't true. But it doesn't count against you. It also doesn't count for you. Your flesh no longer counts for you. God, or good deeds done in the flesh don't count at all. Think about a different example. In, in Paul's letter to the Colossians, he writes, and this is, by the way, the if part. If you then were raised with Christ, desire those things which are above, where Christ sits at the right hand of God. See or set your affections on the things above, not on the things on earth. For you are dead and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, that he shall also appear with him in glory. But think about it this way. If you're doing the things, you're being obedient to God with an eternal perspective, these are the things that I have been doing for eternity. These are this is obedience to Christ and all that He asks us to do in His Word. I can reap the benefit and, and, and you know, have that set up for me. Those treasures that are being stored in heaven, just like Jesus did. He had that eternal perspective, even though He was asked to suffer greatly. But if you do a good deed with selfish perspective, then your good, your good deed doesn't count. It counts for nothing. And you won't reap the reward for that good work. And a lot of people don't understand that concept. Celebrities especially. Oh, we might give millions of dollars to charitable work and charitable stuff that I live like today. Doesn't count. Thank you for your wonderful donations. Therefore, this is the after the if that we just read. Therefore, put to death the parts of your earthly nature. Sexual immorality. Uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God comes on the sons of disobedience. You also once walked in these when you lived in them, but now you must also put away all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, and filthy language out of your mouth. As a new creature, you know, we should take a look at these lists, right? And we should say, nope, 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 uh-oh. These sins that we see in these lists, they're not a part of the new creature. We're still walking in any of those things, those earthly desires. We're still walking in the flesh. It's still fleshly. Putting to death the earthly nature is the being made perfect part that we talk about. You are perfect, but you are being made perfect. Putting to death all those earthly desires, no matter how long it takes, that is the being made perfect portion. There are two different things. Perfect and imperfect, being made perfect. But what we'll sin, we're gonna stumble, we're gonna trip, we're gonna fall, those things are going to take place, it happens to everybody. No matter how hard we try, because we still live in this carnal meat suit, it's going to take place. You're going to be angry in an unrighteous way. You know, you may slam a hammer on your thumb, and you're going to say something that you wish you hadn't. Those things are going to take place in all of our lives. But if you're a new creature, if you're a new creature, then things need to change. If you're a new creation, then you need to use a different or another if then statement. Let's take a look. If we confess our sin, 
He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Okay, it's kind of a backwards if-then statement, but if we confess, then he will forgive. If we confess, then he will forgive. Paul continues with another admonition for us to take a look at in verse 9. We're going through Colossians chapter 3, by the way. If you want to do some homework, go back and read it for yourself later. It's a great, great read. Really, really very helpful. It says, Do not lie to one another, since you have put off the old nature and its, and its deeds. If we were to talk about if then, we would say, If you have put off the old nature and its deeds, then don't lie to each other. What does that mean? What's that mean? What's that if then statement stand for? Anyway, there's no doubt that we all lie to ourselves, right? But I'm a much better person. I think I'm a much better person than you. you know, I mean, I, I hope everybody, or I, I probably could say, I think everybody probably is the same. No, I'm a better person than that. But you, you don't. You're going to fall back. You're going to do things that you don't want to do. But we also lie to each other. Stuff happens all the time. Right. Now, Satan's not pushing my buttons. I'm good. Yeah, what, what's it? Oh, not much. Not much. It's all good here. I'm, I'm at church Sunday. I'm early. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I've got everything is all put together. My life is this perfect beacon of Christianity. I'm sure you guys have heard the phrase, iron sharpens iron. Iron sharpens iron. What's that mean? Is we as Christian brothers and sisters. We help each other. We sharpen each other. We are each other's mentors and we are each other's accountability. If if the sword stays in the scabbard and you try to sharpen it, all you get is a sharp scabbard. If people don't know the things that you're going through, if you're not asking for help, if you're not leaning on someone who who may have been through the same exact thing and can give you godly advice because that's where they've been, then you're not using the body of Christ the way the body of Christ was designed to be used by our Lord and Savior. You're not following the principles that are laid out in the Bible to us to be able to live the lives and be conformed to the image of Christ like we're supposed to be. Real new Christians are authentic Christians. Paul continues in verse number 10. But I, I want to read the last half of number 9 again before we do that. It says, Since you have put off the old nature with its deeds, if, and have embraced the new nature, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him who created it, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, slave nor free, but Christ is all and in all. So embrace, that's a command, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, a spirit of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness and long suffering, bear with one another and forgive one another. If anyone has a quarrel against anyone, even as Christ forgave you, so you must do. And above all these things, embrace love, which is the bond of perfection. If you're truly a new creature, then embrace, embrace all of these positive attributes that we find in Christ Jesus. Are we not to be made in Christ's image? He, he possessed all of these. He possessed all of these. And listen, Paul gives some fabulous advice in Colossians chapter 3. He does, but we're going to take a look at it just for a second from another perspective coming from James. What do we see in James? Is there, well, there's that word again, therefore. We'll, we'll talk about what comes from here. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and remaining wickedness and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. I'm going to stop there for a second. Does everybody know what the engrafted word is? Okay, so if you take this book and you just, and it's dusty, and it's just sitting on your bookshelf and you don't ever crack the pages of this book, it, it, there's no potential that this will ever become engrafted. It, it might become infested by ants, but it's never going to be engrafted. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. 
Listen, if, if this is what happens when we read God's Word, and we read it over, and we read it over, and it becomes to be a part of who we are, it becomes to be a part of what's in our heart, it's engrafted within us so that we catch ourselves doing something all of a sudden, and it's not just the Holy Spirit screaming in your, in your heart, hey, that's wrong. Listen to your conscience. I mean, it literally, it's like, oh, wait a minute, I can't do that. You know, we step back. Wait a minute, that's, I, I remember that. I can't, can't be a part of that. I gotta walk in a different direction. Oh, I'm angry, I'm about to. Wait, no, God's word says don't do that. That's engrafted. That means it's there and it's, it is permanent and it will never go anywhere. That's what the engrafted word means. So let's go back and start again. So, uh, with the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man viewing his natural face in a mirror. He views himself and goes his way and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But whoever looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, it is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This man will be blessed in his deeds. All right, let's start. Let's let's, let's start. Let's talk about the mirror analogy. You know I, that used to confuse me, but you know I, I'm going to put it real simple. All right, I open up the I open up the Bible and I'm reading along. Remember, I was the nope, 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 nope. Uh oh, just a minute ago, I come across an uh oh. Wait a minute. I'm not walking in the way that God's commanding me to. I'm not being obedient to God's word. That's that right there. That's me. And now I put this down, have to go lucky, and you go right back to the same thing again. That's forgetting yourself. That's forgetting your face in the mirror. That's not understanding what kind of a man you are in the reflection of you. That's exactly what this means. So we need to take that into account in all of the things that we do. This is what this passage starts out. So let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not work the righteousness of God. That's our if. Okay. And then, so if we understand that, and we understand, anger, by the way, is, is, is the biggest problem that humanity has. Unrighteous anger is one of the biggest problems that humanity has. Just look at social media. Everybody is just desperately angry. They're mad at everybody. You can't, I mean, you can't post the most wonderful Christmas message <laughs> on social media without having a bunch of people come on and talk about, oh my God, that's not very inclusive. No, we're terrible people, you know. What about, what about Hanukkah? What about Kwanzaa? You know, everybody is mad. This is, the, this is part of the problem. So we understand the if statement. If you're not angry, then, you know, if you've overcome those things, then do these things. This is what James is trying to tell us. Okay? We have to lay aside all those fleshly things that are not a part of the new creature that you are. Here in Christ, you're new. Brand new. Spanking. But we have to do that so that we can be in a position we can be in a position to get the engrafted word, to allow the Spirit to pull that into us. To, so we just don't look at the Bible and see something and walk along our merry way. We need the Spirit to be not pushed down, not subjugated. He needs to have open access to your entire life so that that word can become engrafted. A new creation is a new Things should be different. Should not look the same before as after. And the best thing at the very bottom is that that person blessed. I love that word. It's a great word. Blessed is an absolute wonderful word. So if a brother or sister asks you, hey, what's new? Your answer shouldn't be, oh, no, look. There should be new stuff. There should be new stuff happening every day. There should be things that are taking place in your life that you can, I mean, even the bad things that are in your life. And we'll talk about that in a second, too. Great time to make a change. Great time to look at your life a little bit different. If our lives remain exactly the same, 
and there's no movement in them, we've forgotten what we look like. Listen, Satan absolutely loves us to be stuck in a place in the old ways. He wants us to do that. That's exactly what he wants. And if, you know, if a light bulb came along and this means something to you, listen to me. If you start to make changes, if this in any way, shape, or form makes a difference in your life, guess what? There's going to be pushback. Do not expect that all of a sudden, if you go, you know what, I get what this is saying. There are some things that I need to take, you know, I need to work on. Don't expect it to now be easy sailing. That isn't the way it works. There's going to be pushback. Anything that isn't moving isn't subject to friction. Okay? That's some scientific law, right? No, it doesn't. It, so you expect pushback. You expect things to happen. You are perfect, but you are being made perfect. You know, Paul sums it up, and he's got these wonderful things for us in Colossians. He sums it up to all, almost perfectly in talking about his own life in his letter to Philippi, to the church of Philippi, the Philippians. Let's take a look at that. It says, not that I have already attained. Now, remember, this is Paul speaking. You know, Paul, who wrote like a whole bunch of of the New Testament. This is Paul speaking. Not that I have already attained or have already been perfected, but I follow after it, so that I may lay hold of that for which I was seized by Christ Jesus. Brothers, I do not count myself to have attained, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal to the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let those of us who are mature be thus minded. Be thus minded. And if you think differently in any way, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, according to what we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule. Let us be of the same mind. Brothers, become fellow imitators with me and observe those who walk according to our example. For many are walking in such a way that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. I have told you of them often and tell you again, even weeping. Their destination is destruction. Their God is their appetite. Their glory is in their shame. Their minds are set on earthly things. Who's Paul talking about? This isn't the heathens that he's talking about. He's talking to the church. He's talking to the church here. But our citizenship is in heaven, from where also we await for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our body of humiliation so that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working of his power, even to subdue all things to himself. Last week I talked, and I said, or said that uh, if, you're, if, you're, if you have a life in Christ, that you are able to have your cake and eat it too. Remember there's a, you can't have your cake and eat it too, but I think we had a loophole that we found. That's because if you, if you live this life, if you abide in this life, include suffering, okay, that's you know, all those guarantee, and yet God restores us, he heals us, he strengthens us, and he establishes us. And he gives us his spirit to be able to do all of that. To walk in all of that. To abide in all of that. He gives us the strength to do that. That's where you get the cake and eat it too. So even though our life might be, there might be suffering in our life, we may come under attack. You know, you may get that friction that we talked about because you're making a move on the other side. God will give you the piece of cake that is him holding you up, him giving you the strength to get through it. He has told us that there will be nothing that we are given that we can't, that we can't, I think we can't handle through him with his help. And he will always, he will always provide an escape hatch. It will be a place that we can, you know, we can get out of. We choose the things of earth, things of the flesh, the devil's plug of food cakes. Uh, we can count on destruction. I want to make sure I, 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 I phrase this the right way. Because you know, we, a lot of times, 
you know, when we think of destruction in our mind, you know, we think that that's, you know, the last part of Revelation, that part that's reserved for Satan and his demons and, and unrepentant sinners and, you know, horrible people, people that shake their fist at the Lord, that that's destruction, that's what's there. Is that really all that may be talking about? 1 Corinthians chapter 3 says this. It says, each one's work will be revealed. For the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test what sort of work each has done. If anyone's work which he has built on the foundation endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, still going through the fire. See, when it's talking about destruction, it's not talking about your eternal destruction. It's, and, and, and I can't think of anything more embarrassing than to be a Christian who's actually going to make it through by fire, standing before the Lord, with this pride of this big haul of stuff behind you that you think you've done with the right motives and all of those things, and all of a sudden it's tested by fire and everything goes up in a puff of smoke. It is all gone, and you suffer the loss of looking back at you. I mean, there is nothing worse that I can see than a life that is spent going up in flames. A life's work that goes up in flames. Nothing, nothing worse than I can even think of. God's word shows us that, you know, that there's a time of when and where we've gotten off the right path. It will explain this exactly that. It'll also tell us how to get back on the right path again. And it also helps us to understand how to stay on the right path. And you keep moving in the right direction. But this is the important thing. That path, that right path, runs over with new things. It is absolutely full of new things. God does not want us to be frictionless. He does not want us to be stuck in one place. He wants us to be moving forward in the sanctification process that part about being perfected is incredibly important. We got to ask ourselves. We to ask ourselves, what's new? I don't want my answer to be any more. Not much. We want to know about the new things. We want that to be important to us. We want that to be something that we can answer the question, well, let me tell you. It's all positive. God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you for thank you for this church, Lord. These wonderful people. Lord God, thank you for blessing us richly, for getting, for having the need to have a different place, Lord, to meet. Um, that we see as an unbelievable blessing. Thank you for your word, Lord, and for your continuing work in our life to get us to a point that you want us to be. That's thank you. Thank you so much for we lift up this day and these folks to you, Father. Bless their lives. In Jesus' name, your kingdom come soon. In Jesus' name.